to another episode of the Young Professionals Podcast. We've got myself, Luke, and Sarge here again today. Sarge, who are we speaking with? Luke, today we're talking to Lockie Rath. Lockie is a current contract administrator at Built, working across new build, refurbishment, and fit-out construction projects. Lockie studied a Bachelor of Environments, majoring in construction at the University of Melbourne, Lockie began his journey in the construction industry during his second year of university, where he worked as a project coordinator at Harris HMC and continued on there for several years after graduating. Lockie then moved across to Built, his current employer, where he juggled full-time work and studying his Masters of Construction Management at the University of Melbourne, which he completed in June 2020. Lockie, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. So um, we might jump straight into it. What is a contract administrator? So contract administrator, um, I guess, sits within a within a broader construction uh, project team. So at at, at built a construction administrator um, looks after the commercial and contracts on you could say finance as well within it within a construction project. So. There's many different facets that the that the team covers, but the contract administrator specialises in all things commercial contracts, um, day-to-day dealings with subcontractors for variations, dealing upstream to the clients with uh, with delays, extension of times, and more um, more commercial matters. You've you've mentioned a lot of a lot of buzzwords there, and we'll we'll try to um, understand what each of those are. Um, the first one, I suppose, you, you mentioned like the the contract side and variations. What is it? What is a variation? So for for a construction project, when um, I guess it gets awarded to a builder and there's a there's an agreed price that um, that the that the builder wins the job for, and say he's got to build it for a hundred million dollars. So along the journey, there may be discrepancies. There may be additional work that gets added to the scope and 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 varied to the scope. So that uh, that attracts a either a rise or fall in cost um, and that that rise and fall has to be substantiated and, and proven. So my role as a, I guess, a contract administrator managing the finance is to justify, prove, put a value on specific scopes of work um, and, uh, and and push that through to the client for, for ultimately their, their approval and their consideration to, to either proceed or not proceed with, with more or less work. In saying that, there's there's also unexpected costs that come online that um that we may identify and we have to justify that they are I guess over and above our contractual requirements and 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 the agreed scope. And and um for for those listening at home, that scope is contained within the contract. Yeah, um, correct. correct. And on that, in terms of um the the different issues that one can face in terms of variations, what types of, what types of things do you see as a contract administrator? So talking, I guess, talking, there's, there's different layers to variations. So from, from my side being the builder, there's, there's variations that we pass up the line to, uh, to a client. So that could be a, a building owner. It could be a property developer. It could be a, a private, a private client of, of some sort, say aged care, something like that, that they, they may vary the scope to specific to their business needs. It may be it may be expanding the structure. It may be um, a change in in product specification. Say a, a simple example there might be a, a client when they start the project changes their mind on a type of timber flooring that they want and they want a more expensive timber flooring. So you need to, I guess, prove and justify the increasing costs and the against the quantity and the and the required scope. So that's. An example of, I guess, a client-driven change. Uh, uh, another form of variations that that I have to deal with are, are variations coming from our subcontract subcontractor base up the line to us. So we would engage plumbers, electricians, um, you know, partitioners, and 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 concreters and the like, and they may find differences in the scope, they may find existing conditions that they need to, they need to, I guess, remedy to continue their scope and that may attract variation. So again, it's, it's being a, it's being a filter, it's being a filter and an assessor of, of variations coming upstream to the builder as well as, as, um, as it is downstream. So it's a, it's a busy, it's a busy role that, that I have it once, once a construction project starts and is in full swing and you're a couple months into a job you're you're generally dealing with a lot of 
variation traffic from both ends going coming into into your books from subcontractor bases and going out up to the client as well. So I guess the overarching goal there for me is to is to make money on on I guess one the agreed the agreed contract figure that we have to to maximise I guess our starting margins and then incremental increases along the way with um with both variations coming in and going out to the client as well. Look, you've obviously got a, a lot of uh, spinning plates to handle there and it seems like you're very much the the middleman to make sure that everything is flowing um, okay and obviously too budget and hopefully under budget and that's where you can make some make some margin like you said um do you want to just run us through what your current employer built uh, the company you're working for where they sit kind of in the market in terms of construction and by that i mean what kind of projects are they going to be managing um is that kind of your large scale bridges and, and, and big buildings and things like that? Or is it more, as you said, aged care and, and what and kind of step us through the differences that, that people could be getting involved in if they get into the industry? Yep, sure. So built, um, so built uh, our, our, we're a national business at the moment. So based in every, every state and, and sort of major city within Australia, New Zealand, and we've just opened an office in London as well. Um, so built as a, as a national presence is, is, considered a, a large tier one construction contractor. So within the construction industry, there's there's multi-tiered builders and your, your household names of, of Lemlease, John Holland and Multiplex would sit in a tier one, builds probably a, a borderline tier one and tier two contractor. Tier two is, is, um, is I guess, still a, a large, larger scale builder. Um, and then it steps down to, you know, your, your smaller tiered builders that, that wouldn't dabble in High risk, high scale construction, um, but still, still complete similar scopes, just at a just at a smaller scale. So, with, with the high risk and high scale, can you just elaborate on, on that and and what brings in say risk to a construction project? Uh, is it time or money or, or both? So with so with with that built um, I guess built niche and built built point of difference within within the market is is uh, dealing with complex. Um, and, and unique style projects that that may not suit a lot of a lot of builders. So built, talking specifically specialists in in heritage heritage refurbishment work, um, anything with live environments, um, and anything that's anything that's high risk. So some big examples there that builds finished in the last couple of years is with Flinders Street Station refurbishment. So working on a live train station is is not easy. Um, and then having the, I guess, junction of of Swanston Street and Flinders Street on the external side adds adds complexity and live environments of a different sort as well. So it's a it's a high risk project for for different reasons, um, satisfying different stakeholders. But that's a it's a I guess a niche that that built has become quite good at. So it's it's stepping away. So it's it's not that. Built just as heritage work. We do we do commercial towers as well. We're building two student accommodation towers at the top of the popular city at the moment. There's a, uh, a hotel that we're building at Melbourne Airport too. So there's there's different scales, different sectors of construction that we that we dabble with. Um, and then it's and then it stretches down to other refurbishment work as well. So we may have uh, an existing office building or an ex- or an existing building that is going to transform its use. It's, it's been rezoned and will come in, refurbish, um, and, and transform it to a, to a commercial office or, or something else or mixed use, whatever it is. So it's all sorts of new build heritage refurbishment, even fit out work as well, which is what I've done in the past. Um, so that's and, and all different scales as well. So we made, do projects of anything from 500,000, which would be a maybe a small maintenance job, a, a facade replacement, which is which is ever present at the moment with combustible cladding, um, all the way up to a 200 million dollar tower. And when when you're out on um, at all, the, all these different construction sites, what are you what are you doing day to day? Like what is like say um, you were to go to work on 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 a Monday, what what would what would that look like? Yeah. So with so again, it's it's different different practices for different um, different businesses. Built built project teams, and and I'm in the project team would would structure themselves all on site and base themselves on site. So we'd have our own site office and site accommodation within our construction our construction compound. We'd we'd have a 
we'd have a site manager, a project coordinator, um, project engineers, project managers, a contract administrator like myself, um, and then and then labourers and HSE staff as well. All all our direct reports within our build team, um, all working as a cohesive u- unit, um, finishing or, or I guess taking care of different responsibilities to to ultimately deliver the construction projects on time um, and to a to an acceptable quality. With that, Lockie, and I think if anyone's interested in the construction industry, some some roles that they might have heard are of are uh, say like project management or project coordinator or engineer. Where does a contract administrator fit in on that? If there is a hierarchy, or is it as you say, just a, a group of the team and you're kind of on par with the rest of those team players? Yeah, yeah. So starting, I guess that helps us to kind of walk through my my career. I guess in in terms of different levels. So I started I started stepping from from uni to the industry straight in as a as a project coordinator. I didn't go through a graduate program like some of the some of the big bigger firms have. Um, I stepped through a smaller business, came through as a project coordinator, um, and then progressed to a project engineer. So that's a, I guess it's a, a level of graduate project coordinator, project engineer, all doing similar roles around managing safety, coordinating trades, um, and managing the program. But again, different responsibilities and different complexities to your role as you step up. Um, above a project engineer would be a project manager. And then the CA or the contract administrator sits, I guess, in tandem with the project manager, managing the commercial aspects of the project. So you might have a site manager that wants to order more protection or more fencing on a on a site. He has to come through through myself to seek approval to, to spend the money and, and place the order. Yeah. And then above above a above a project manager, of course, then is your yeah, your construction managers, your general managers, your operations managers that that oversee a portfolio of projects. You jumped into the industry pretty early, um, getting your first role at Harris HMC uh, whilst you were studying. Um, you were studying your Bachelor of Environments and you majored in construction uh, doing that. Uh, what what drove you to do your Bachelor in, of Environments and um, did you always think you would end up in the construction industry? It's a good, it's an interesting, interesting question, much like I guess a lot of other people that find themselves in construction doing what I'm doing. They, it's not what they originally set out to do when they when they finished school. I I set out and was hell bent on on pursuing architecture as a um, as a profession when I when I left school. So RMIT architecture was my number one preference. I got my number two preference at, at Melbourne University, Bachelor of Environments, in a as a blessing in disguise. It was it was a broad uh, first twelve months at Melbourne under the Melbourne model, um, and exposed me to, I guess, all aspects of the built environment, um, being property construction, architecture, town planning, landscape architecture. So I I started the first twelve months of my architecture. Bachelor of Environments Architecture, um, and then quickly worked out after the first two semesters that this this wasn't for me, and it, and I guess the idea that I had of architecture was was a lot different to in practice, which uh, I'm not really gonna I wasn't gonna find that out until I actually dove into it and started it, but it was it was an experience nonetheless. That what what was the idea of architecture that you had, and, and where did that come from? All through, so all through. Well, I guess all through my final years at school, I, I structured my subjects around around pursuing design. Um, and I guess I guess it's, it's no I guess it's no critic of the of the the counselling that I had through um through my schooling, but a lot of the options that I now know of in the industry weren't made available to me. So I, I guess I was pushed, well not pushed, but encouraged to go down a pathway of the I guess the the highlighted and emphasised architecture stream because it's a not 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 more or less held on a pedestal, but it's a it's an attractive profession, and um, that's that's I guess what I associated myself with and wanted to pursue. So, leaving school and entering into a into tertiary education, that's what I that's what I followed because that's what I was told that I was to do. So. Luckily for me, I entered into Bachelor of Environments and there is a, a broader first year that, it, that exposed me to different options. And it, 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 I could have gone down the property pathway if I wanted to. I could have gone down the town planning pathway, but 
having certain subjects and certain um, exposures to industry, uh, it became quite clear that I still enjoy the process of building and, and building forms and being in, involved in the built environment, um, just not at the front end designing, rather rather managing the, the actual structure. So I, I still I still day to day would deal with architects and engineers and and surveyors. Um, we're all still in the same industry industry closely linked. It's it's just a different specialization within the broader construction and engineering um, industry. Just on on that, um, you obviously studied Melbourne and, and it's more of a generalist degree to begin with. And um, if anyone that doesn't know Melbourne Uni, they have these things called bread subjects and they I think they have to make up a certain percentage of your degree, which gives you an opportunity to do some different things. Um, what Like what's your reflection on attending Melbourne and um, having that more generalist experience versus somewhere like a Monash or a Deakin or an RMIT where um, you, you might be uh, pushed to, to specialize a bit earlier? Well, for, for me, it was advantageous. It was, it was very advantageous. Now, not saying that it's going to be for everyone. Um, you may finish school knowing that you want to uh, pursue medicine and, and you follow through with that. And, and that's, and that's perfectly fine. And some institutions offer that, but um, for me, it offered, and it wasn't intentionally that I made this decision to, to go to Melbourne for this reason, but in hindsight, it was it was advantageous because it offered, um, I guess, that diversity within the industry that I wasn't aware of. I wasn't aware that I wasn't aware that you could pursue a site manager pathway straight out of school. I wasn't aware that um, you know there's there's client side project managers are different to construction company project managers. That there's property development. That there's all these different facets through the industry that um, the industry that I wanted to wanted to be a part of that just wasn't made available or, or to, to my knowledge um, at the time of applying for, for courses. So in, in hindsight, yeah, Melbourne, Melbourne was a, was a good option for me. It um, definitely offered me more flexibility and, and a chance to, to move within, within the industry early on. Yeah. St- staying on that for a sec before we jump into say your, your next couple of steps and, and your first jobs in, in industry, if there are students in say back end of high school, like your, your 10, year 11 and 12 that are interested or think there are, they are interested in getting into architecture or any, um, any facet of the, the built environment, like, like you said, what would be some recommendations from you in terms of what they can do that is external to say just school or, or talking to their parents? Are there other people that they should go be speaking with or industry bodies or anyone that they can be drawing some more information from? Yeah. Well, as, as you, as you broadly touched on the, the only way to, I guess, understand what the roles and responsibilities and day-to-day tasks of that job or that profession that you're interested in is, is to, is to dive in and, find those people within the industry and, and talk to them. And if you can, if you can, like I, I, I sought out a, an architecture firm in my last year of school and, and made contact with them and, and spent two days in their practice in, in Fitzroy. Um, Do you want to just step us through that? Like, so you're in year 12 and you say, you, you know, you sought them out and got contact with them. How yeah. did you do that? What, what are some specifics? Um, it was through, so fortunate enough, I, I had a family friend that was, that was associated with this firm. Um, I made contact with them and they were, they were kind enough to, I guess, spend some time with me for two days, um, me shadowing them and a, a design associate, um, working through a concept, uh, for, a, for a new, for a new project. So I went in for, for two days and, and, and sketched up on, um, on yellow, yellow tracing paper and, um, played around with a few, a few models and a few, and a few test fits, but yeah, it was, it was at the time I, I really enjoyed that and, and that, I guess, fluid design, um, process and, and the, the raw design process was, was still quite attractive to me. There's just a, a lot of other layers behind that, which, um, which I guess you, you can't really touch on when you're there for two days. You need to be there for a, for a more extended period. Um, yeah, but it's, it was it was advantageous for me. It, it, it reaffirmed that that's, I guess, at the time, what I wanted to do um, was to pursue design. Uh, ultimately, going into tertiary education, it wasn't what I stuck with, but 
it was advantageous for, for me to reaffirm my ideas of what do I want to do and which industry do I want to pursue. So, I mean, I, I had I had other thoughts of, of, I mean, through school I was quite active and, and quite, um, I guess, quite active in, in certain sports and, and the health and fitness was was an idea as well to, to pursue that avenue, but I chose not to. I chose to go through the through the construction industry or through the, yeah, through the through the built environment industry, and it's um, that's probably I have no regrets in doing that. That's, that's it was the right move for me, which is which is this probably two days of spending at an architecture firm re- reaffirm those thoughts for me. Oh, that's probably a nice segue into the next question. Um, you 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 completed your masters of construction management recently, um, and you started doing that while you're working full time. Do you want to take us through why why you chose to do your masters of construction management? Yeah, so for me, for me, the masters of construction management, and, and again, this is a this is probably specific to Melbourne. You you exit you exit your bachelor of environments with a bachelor of environments. Um, although you specialise in construction, you you're still in the cohort of a bachelor of environments. Um, for me, completing a masters of construction management um, is is a differentiator. For myself within the industry as a I guess as a as a higher high level of education, yes, but as a as a specialist within the within the industry. Um, so for me, I chose to follow straight through from finishing a bathroom environments to start a master's of construction management um, and and pursue that through through to the end, purely purely because I I don't want to I guess I don't want to. I don't want to hit a hit a certain ceiling within the industry and 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 be held back from from progression. Um, so there's there's certain, I guess, degrees and, and master's degrees. One of them to to alleviate that and to and to differentiate yourself above above certain certain cohorts that wouldn't have um, wouldn't have pursued that pathway. Do you think it's worth uh, getting the experience or dipping your toes into industry a little bit first before, say, jumping straight into a master's degree that obviously, as you said, is a lot more specialised than a bachelor or is it kind of horses for courses and just dep- depends on the on the case of the individual? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think it's I think it's very essential to, to have industry experience before you step into a, into a master's. The, the content that you're learning within your master's degree um, is is applicable to what happens within the industry. So you need a reference point to to really capitalize on those learnings. Um, for me, going through my masters and talking openly, I, I would base assignments off real life projects that I'm doing um, within my within my roles of work. So doing a master's part time while working at the same time, I was able to utilize, I guess, systems, softwares, processes that I have at work. And implement that into my assignments, which was kind of read. Again, it was it was just reaffirming and reestablishing existing knowledge that I had, but putting it into an uh, into an assessment matrix and and actually, I guess, fine tuning certain aspects of, of the way and and why I do things within the industry. Um, and again, you, within a master's course, a lot of a lot of it within the masters of construction is is group and color and collaboration based. So. With that, you've got other students that are at other construction businesses within the industry. So you're all coming together with different systems and softwares and processes and challenging each other on the way that we do things differently, which is, I guess that's that's where you spur your, your learning and your thought process. And um, yeah, it was, it was quite quite beneficial and, and, and made, um, made it quite relevant to, to what I was doing in my day-to-day work as well. Just on that too, it, as you said, it's another point of um, point of reference for feedback because like obviously you get feedback at work from the people you're working with and your client. But when you're doing those assignments, you're submitting those assignments, you get feedback from the people that grade them. And as you said, you're working with different people or people from that are in industry at different businesses. So you, you get feedback from them and you get to understand um, what they're doing in at, at their employers in terms of, um, like what's best practice in the industry. Yeah, correct. Correct. Which is, um, was interesting. A few of the, a few of the other, a few of the other people in my, in my, say my, my uni groups that we kind of stuck with throughout our, throughout our masters. Um, and they're at all different, different ranges of construction companies. We all follow similar systems. So regardless of the 
scale or the the type of building that you're doing, you're you're all following the same system. So your knowledge is quite transferable across the industry, regardless of where you establish yourself or where you start or where you might finish. You'll find that you know the the construction process and and the steps from start to finish don't change a great deal. They're just kind of deviating a little bit off the norm or off the the the, the best practice ideal. Um, which is which is it's interesting, and it's like working for a, for any business. You're going to take the good out of it and and leave the bad that you that you don't want to to take with you. So, um, again, it was another, as you said, a feedback loop. It was another another point of reference that I wouldn't have got from from just working at, at within a business because I, to no fault of of their own, people that have been at a at a business and especially a construction business that might seem not as progressive as other as other industries or other businesses. There's some individuals that sit within there that are quite headstrong um, and it's the way that they've always done it or have done it for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, testing, testing that with, with external sources and external networks is, um, is very beneficial and the master's provided that for me. Uh, all, all very good points. And, and one that sticks out to me there in terms of the benefit of doing masters or any postgrad study when it's relative, uh, sorry, relevant to your field is the the networking aspect of it. And particularly when the other, uh, not, not colleagues, but other people that are taking part in that course are also in, in, in industry. You're, as you say, opening yourself up to talk to them um, about the processes that, 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 that they are using and, and whatnot and what you just said. But do you want to talk to kind of the power of networking, particularly say in the construction industry and how, if it is in, important to, to get on top of that quite early and the benefits of that? Yeah, so in, um, I guess, I guess I'll talk through chronologically from when you start your career. So starting in the, in the, in the industry, your, your initial contacts and your network is going to be your subcontractor base. So you're, 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 mo- you're mainly focused on site and, and building and, and growing the technical skills of how do we put a building together um, and the, best people that can tell you how to do that are, are the experts in the trades. So spending a lot of time with, you know, as I said, your plumbers, your carpenters, your, your brickies, your, your, your electricians, they're, they're, they're the lifeblood of the industry and they're, they're the, ultimately the people that are going to build the project for you. We don't actually do the building work ourselves. We, we manage it. They're your, they're your hands and hands and your resources. So that is a, that is a, your most powerful network as a, as a, as a junior coming into the industry um, is to be able to build that, that rapport with, with your subcontractor base. Now that's, again, it's, it's, it's hard to build a deep kind of subcontractor base early because you need a high frequency of projects to do that, to change over subcontractors from project to project. And just, just to be clear on that, when you say build up your subcontractor base, is that uh, as a junior person, you want uh, different uh, touch points at different uh, subcontractors to say, "Hey, we've got this new building. Can you come and be the the bricklayer for it, or or the plumber, or whatever?" Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, correct, correct. So when so when you say a say a built say built when a project, we um we have to award a demolition package. Now we um we have a pool of 10, 15, 20 demolition contractors around Melbourne that we would touch base with, and we'd say, "Hey, we've got this project." Um, would you like to submit a price if they haven't already? If they have, then then we'll obviously talk to them. If they haven't, then we um we make contact and let them know about the opportunity and give them an opportunity to to price for the work as well. So again, speaking from a profit driven organisation approach, we we have a budget that we need to meet for each package and having a deep and and I guess a, a good subcontractor base assists you in, in meeting your incremental budgets for each trade. Um, again, there's different caliber of, of contractors out there and there's different um, quality and, and scale of, of contractors that can that can complete certain work. So having a deep and diverse subcontractor base is is powerful in completing different types of work, different scales of work. Um, and again, as you might hear, like you know, subcontractors often fall out with certain builders. So if you put all your eggs in one basket and and have a falling out on a project over a certain issue, then you need to have that fallback network that you can you can rely on if um if things do go sour with certain contractors. So that's that's the downstream 
networking aspect. I guess upstream is, is quite different in terms of your client clientele base, your um, your architects who we who we often hear a lot of opportunities from from when it, when projects are in, in their conceptual stage, um, going through schematic designs to to planning approvals with council. The the architects are a key figurehead in that process. So architects feed us a bit of work. Um, clients in the in the form of, of property developers, building owners, um, investment funds, they they feed us projects, refurbishment of, of existing buildings that have reached their life expense expectancy. So it's um yeah, it's a it's a deep, deep network process. No, definitely. And that point is really interesting. Um the, the, as you as you phrased it, the upstream networking, and not so much from a "Hey, can you help me get a job?" perspective, but in once you're in the job from a commercial point of view, where are you going to be getting that work from? And I had a similar um, piece of advice from a, a more senior person than me when I started in a grad program, and he was like, "Mate, the one of the more important things you can do during uni is make a network of people who are in similar industries to you, because in ten years' time." you'll probably be working at different companies and they're going to be feeding you work and you'll be feeding them work. And that's how it works from a commercial point of view. So um, I think that's an important thing to to realize as early as you can. It's not so much that you're helping each other get, you know, a job and, and that kind of thing. It can, you can get work from it later on. Correct. Correct. Yeah. The most, the most fundamental part of our business is, is the ability to, to win work without, Without winning work, I I don't have a job within a project team. So as case in point at the moment, we we need to win work to um to keep our project teams busy, um, keep revenue coming in the door from a from a construction progress standpoint. Uh, um and that and that comes from comes from those contexts that we have from from previous clients, um, repeat clients, which are a big percentage of our business are repeat clients. Um and, and referrals from from other experts throughout the industry. Yeah, so I, I I have I guess contacts from my university days that are at different builders. I've I've also got a few a few of those individuals have have moved on to different aspects of the industry after finishing a bachelor of environment. Some are with with property developers um, with a more technical mindset than a finance mindset. Um, some have moved on to client side project managers to uh, so engineering firms and, and they're all they're all valuable contacts to maintain because as, as you said you never know when you need to tap into a contact pick up the phone and say hey remember me um, if you become aware that that they have they have an opportunity that you're interested in yeah well, on that lucky what what's your approach there when you actually have to do that or when you choose to do that and you you realize there might be an opportunity to to work with someone or you want to learn about something how do you go about that when I um in a in a time gone by a, a, a coffee catch up would have been would have been the go to um in this in this environment it, it becomes a lot more distant um and it is it is purely a case of of picking the phone up and and cold calling which can be confronting at times and and again if you're on the receiving end of a cold call you you need to break the you need to have the barriers broken down quite early in the conversation to be receptive to the call. So it's it's a tricky one and it's a fine art. And the only way to get better at it is to do more of them, which which is no easy task. Um, but yeah, the 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 face to face dealings within the the construction industry I I think are, are paramount. Um, especially with our with our meetings that we have day to day on on a live construction job board contracts trying to win work having a face-to-face conversation um engaging i guess someone's 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 perspective on 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 your message or, or, on, or on the on the relationship is is key yeah and and on that mate um what are, what are some of the the best or worst things that um that are um that come about in terms of working in the construction industry yeah, so the um, I suppose I'll start with the I suppose I'll start with that first. The construction industry, uh, probably probably publicly is a is a high stress industry. There's a lot of there's a lot of milestones and demands which form for for all all layers of the industry from from my role to a site manager's role to a project manager's role. Everyone has 
their own responsibilities um, and accounted and are held accountable for them within a project team. So for me, if the job doesn't make money, that's that's a that's a red mark against my name. If uh, if it doesn't finish on time or to a, to an exceptional quality, that's the site manager and the project manager's responsibility. And all the all of those competing stresses and milestones and targets, I guess, are what are what are what fundamentally makes it it makes it a stressful job. Um, it's for not for everyone, the the construction industry, but if you if you, I guess if you have a high resilience and you and you can handle certain pressures and and compartmentalize and and think your way through different problem solving scenarios, it, it can be quite rewarding. Uh, the both the good side, the good side of why I've maintained in the construction industry for, for the eight years so far that I have been is it's a it's a tangible it's a tangible and a, and a tactile product that we're working on. So it's it's. I guess something rewarding that is going to be there and be physical and be visible for the time to come. So for say our, our business that worked on, on Flinders street station on, and the, and the facade upgrade and the lighting upgrade that's been completed, that, that is front and center for white night in Melbourne for, for years to come. So that's, that's a, something that you can, you know, you can take your friends and family there and, and point at and say, I worked on that for, for six months and, um still looks still looks fantastic yeah that's a it's a it's a rewarding it's a rewarding job that you can um you can you can you can have that reward i guess for for years to come and and relive it that that is one thing that has always seemed really rewarding or that has i would have thought would been really rewarding when you can walk around the city and say you know i helped build that and i helped build that and we did all all of that work on that building or whatever so i think that, that would resonate with anyone that, that is trying to or thinking about getting into the industry. It's like, you know, you, if you, if you're in the industry for 10 or whatever years um, after that, you can probably walk around the city and say, I help build a lot of this stuff. Um, Lucky, just moving forward a little bit, mate, you're obviously very, uh, you understate yourself quite a lot and a bit of background, like where you went to school together. So I know you quite well, you've had a few accolades while you've been at your role in terms of, um, you know, the best fill in the blank. What do you think has been or are some skills and and focus points for you in terms of how you operate day to day and what do you really focus on that lets you succeed in you know your role and obviously you've done quite well at uni and school to get into the degrees that you you have um gotten into what are some principles that you you hold hold dear and help you succeed in that light well first i guess the first one that comes to mind is probably probably echoes the statements from a, from a high stress job with, with many spinning plates at the same time um, is don't, don't sweat the small stuff. So there's a lot of, there's a lot that builds up on your, on your plate on a, on a, a day basis or a weekly basis. You, you may have, and I keep a notebook of all my, all my tasks and activities I need to get done. It, it might be two pages long after, after two days. Um, and to, to some that's, that's very overwhelming, but for, I guess someone that can process, you know, I guess process a lot and and compartmentalize it and and develop a plan to to work through a, a, a big workload is to is to not not sweat the small stuff and not stress out on on items that don't hold great value or don't add great value to the overall process. So there's 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 critical tasks that are essential to be done. Always tick them off first. Always get your always get your your items of high importance started and off your plate first before you you chip away at the the low hanging fruit or the easy gets. So it's it's learning it's learning to prioritize and and work out what's what's critical and and I guess that again that's fundamentally a, a key principle of time management in the end is to work out what's essential and tick those items off first and and let the smaller items and the and the more manageable items that you might want to grab first and run with to, to have some easy wins to push them to to the backs to the back of the um back of the list for, for when it's absolutely critical. I think I think that's awesome advice. Um you were also uh um whilst you were good at school, you're also very good at sport. Um you were you're very you're quite an elite water polo player. Um what 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 learnings, if any, did you take from um, your days playing sport, and how do how have you um, brought them forward into your job at Built and um, through life generally? Yeah, water polo is um, 
not a not a not an easy sport. Um, it's it's tough. Training is tough. Training training is tough for for a water polo player. Um, and often and very much so, a lot more physical and a lot more exhausting than the actual games. Um, yeah, so I guess, I guess that that resonates to to the professional landscape as well. The the time that you put in behind the scenes and and I guess when when no one's watching and and how hard you work behind closed doors and 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 developing yourself and your own skill set pays off for when I guess you are front and center or you you you're required to perform at a at a high level in a commercial sense. You you should have confidence that you've done the hard work behind behind closed doors. So that that's one aspect of I guess elite sportsmen work hard um, offline so that they can be good online. Um, it's the other the other key part of that is is routine. Um, training training lots and training three, four, five times a week and and working to a program um, to achieve it achieve a result or a goal is is key. Um, and that's and that's the same with anything in life, right? If you if you have a goal and you, you need to plan out steps to get there and and, and implement um, strategies and, and ways and ways to incrementally step towards it. Is that something you've kept up, you know, while you've been uh, climbing the climbing the corporate ladder, if you will, and and has that been important to, you know, keeping you, your ability to keep a, a clear head? Um, exercising and fitness is obviously a big part of your life. What, what do you accredit that to in terms of, um, you know, being able to perform at your best at, at work? Yeah, so again, I'll, I'll go back to it, but yeah, the construction industry is a is a stressful industry with um with a, probably a high an absolutely a higher rate of um, mental illness um, than than other industries because of that. Um, I've had it instilled in me from an early age within this industry to to look after your your headspace and and your mindfulness as as much as your your physical fitness, um, and that goes a long way to to maintaining your sanity within the industry. Like a lot of, a lot of people are impacted by small insignificant arguments or, or misunderstandings on site. Um, it doesn't phase me as much. I, I don't know if that's a personality thing or a personal trait, but I, I guess I, I work on my ability to let things go. And, and as I said, don't sweat the small stuff. If, if it's not going to change the overall impact of a project and I'm having an argument about, you know, someone submitting an invoice late, is it going to change the overarching objective for the project? No. So I, I will let that go. Um, yeah. If it's, it, and, and again, if it's, um, yeah, I guess if, if, if you're, if you're struggling in that, in that space, you're, you're, um, you're going to keep bottling things up and it's, and it's going to add up and, and you'll implode at some point. So it's, it's a, ever important to you know, I guess don't sweat the small stuff and, and let things go that are insignificant. And, and on, on the, on the mental health mode, mate, um, what, what advice would you have for students who are um, thinking of maybe preparing for their exams or thinking about um, what they might do next year? Um, what, what are the things you think from your experience that they should be um, focusing on in terms of one study um, but to uh, like in just making their decision about where, what their next steps are. I guess for a, for a student finishing, finishing year 12 is to, is to find a, find an industry, find a, find a passion that's, that's, I guess, broad enough. There's, there's no point. Well, I suppose like I did trying to pick a profession from, from when you're at school. Cause I think, I think as the saying goes, you change your, you change your, you change your, your, your job and your profession seven times through your career. So, I mean, I'm, I'm probably on my second or third at the moment change. Like you, you should just accept that find an industry that you, that you want to work in and you'll, and you'll probably jump between roles and businesses within that industry. And that's, and that's completely fine. Um, I suppose the hard thing at the moment is working out what you enjoy and what you're good at and I guess what, what's obtainable for you. Um, I guess, but it, but the the quicker you can narrow that down, the easier it becomes. You, you you find a couple of courses or a couple of a university that's 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 great in that industry. Find find something of that nature. Stick with that, um, and then once you're once you're admitted to uni and you're accepted, you can 
you can always transfer between like, like I did at Melbourne. I started going in an architecture stream and swapped to construction. If I wanted to, I could have finished my bachelor of environments construction and then done a master's in property if I wanted to. So it's, it's, it's not the end. If you, if you get it wrong, just find something that aligns with, with what you want to do and your passions. I think take that's fantastic advice too. And if you, you can extrapolate that even further um, in terms of don't sweat the small stuff. I know um, particular schools that, that we've been to and our, our mates have been to, there's a massive uh, focus on ATAR is the, the, the be all and end all. Um, and sure, it's important, but I remember older people telling or older students and, and former students telling this to us and, you know, we, we would go back and say, oh, whatever, I still want to get a really high score. It isn't the end of the world if you, if you miss out on, say, the Bachelor of Environments. Like there are other avenues um, to get into that industry and I think that's an, what you bring up is an important focus. It's, it shouldn't be I need to get into that particular course or that particular uni. It's if I like the industry, get me into a course that lets me dip my toe in that and then I can kind of go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And if it was, say, say it went a different way for me and I, and I went down the health and fitness industry, I would have probably done a similar thing. I, 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 I might have done a physio course or, or health sciences or something, something along that line. But I, who, who, who knows, I may have, I may have jumped at some point and, and moved within the industry to, to a health and wellbeing coach or something like you can still jump between or whatever it is. It's, um, yeah, it's just find find your passion, stick with that, and you'll you'll work out the incremental steps to get to where you want to go. I think that's that's super advice. Find your passion, work to your strengths, and you'll um, work out where you need to be. Um, Lucky, thanks for coming on the show, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. No worries. Thank you, boys. I really appreciate the time, mate. And as as we said before, there's heaps of um, good little bits of advice in there for anyone, obviously getting into the or wanting to get into the construction industry. But certainly, you can take that those learnings and apply it to, to any field um, or or any uh, stage in your career, be that high school, uni, or or in, or in industry. So, mate, I really appreciate that. And yeah, thanks for coming on the show.